Okay, can you all hear me well? Yes. Okay, great. I think we will get started to try and stay on time. Um, so welcome everyone uh, to this webinar organized by the thematic working group on rural youth employment, uh, which is part of the global donor platform for rural development. Uh, the thematic working group organizes uh, regularly this type of um, uh, webinars and dialogues with uh, donors, governments, civil society organizations, and youth on various issues concerning uh, rural youth employment. And today's webinar is uh, the first on green jobs, and uh, we will dedicate the next um, hour and a half on green jobs for rural youth in the context of uh, agri-food systems and try to get a sense of what they are and uh, how they're being promoted and what are some of the opportunities and, and challenges. Um, just some housekeeping rules, I think it was posted um, that you may have missed. Uh, you can share comments or links or relevant uh, references in the chat function. Uh, but if you have specific questions to these speakers at any time during the webinar, please, you can write them in the Q&A uh, box. But uh, we will also have an opportunity to um, open the floor to, to the audience. So, you know, we really encourage you. It's a small group. I encourage you to, to raise your hand um, and ask it directly during the open session to the, to the speakers. And uh, of course, trying to keep your question uh, short and concise. So let me now invite our co-chair, Frank uh, Bertelmann, to say a few uh, introductory remarks. Yes. Frank? Yeah, thank you very much, Jiyun, and welcome from my side. My name is Frank Bertelmann. Um, I'm the head of the project um, Rural Youth Employment with GIZ and one of the co-chairs, as just mentioned. And yeah, I'm really excited about today's webinar. I think with interesting inputs, hopefully a lively discussion and distinguished speakers and panelists uh, who will discuss the topic from diverse perspectives. So I think first of all, we will start off with a keynote from Professor Poshin then have some very concrete project examples from the ILO and the FAO, and then a panel with different voices from youth representatives, the private sector, the African Union, different donors, and of course, the discussion with all of you, I think will, be, uh, will contribute to a very lively discussion. So just to set the scene, uh, I think we all agree that sustainable agriculture is not really a new topic, uh, but the UN Food System Summit last year has shown again that and also how we need to collaborate beyond our silos to find solutions for the triple P people, planet or profit, or however you want to call the different dimensions of sustainability. And I think also what we all agree is regarding our planetary boundaries, uh, the agri-food sector is part of the challenge and the problem, but also has to be a key part of the solution. But I think still there are diff quite different understandings and also concepts about sustainable agriculture, about agroecology, climate smart agriculture, resource efficiency, water management. So I think many different dimensions and you cannot look at the agri-food sector in isolation, uh, but still I think this, especially the topic for green jobs in the agri-food sector is a rather new one for the rural development community. And at least for our working group, and so the bottom line, I think, is um, how does sustainable agri-food system transformation can look like? What are the required skill sets, especially for young people to engage and shape this transformation? And what are the implications for policymakers, for donors, for all of us to support this process? So I think um, these are the key questions um, or maybe the bigger picture behind it. Uh, and I'm very much looking forward to this webinar the, and the different inputs and to dis uh, discuss these questions with all, all of you. And yeah, I would like to thank you in advance for your active participation and over to you, Jiyun, for the moderation. Thank you, Frank. So I forgot to introduce myself. <laughs> I'm Jiyun uh, from the OECD Development Center and I'll be moderating and emceeing uh, you know, for, for the next hour and a half uh, we are um, very privileged today to have with us Dr. Peter Poshen. Dr. Poshen is Professor of Socioeconomic Sustainability at the University of Freiburg, uh, but he also worked uh, for 30 years uh, for the ILO as coordinator of the Green Jobs Program, 
He was director of the enterprise department and uh, director of the country office for um, Brazil. Uh, he has been basically active for over 40 years in international development uh, in Africa, Asia, Americas, and uh, especially with a focus on land use, natural resources, uh, rural development, private sector, and obviously green jobs uh, more recently. So Dr. Poshin will deliver the keynote speech and which will set the scene for the more um, specific discussion on green jobs. Thank you so much, Dr. Poshin, for um, taking the time to be with us today and the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Jijun. Uh, for me, it's uh, I'm I'm very pleased, uh, thankful for this uh, invitation because um, for um, an outside observer, you now uh, agriculture has really not been receiving the attention that that it badly needs from a number of points of view. What I will try to um, do uh, in a broad brush view, uh, given the shortage of time is to share my concern about they're perhaps brewing a perfect storm regarding agriculture and the labor market. Um, speak briefly about what green jobs are and why they matter uh, for any transformation to uh, a sustainable economy and arguably particularly in agriculture. And then look what could green jobs look like in the agri-food system and in rural areas and what are the enabling conditions that would probably be needed in order to make that shift and what uh, green jobs might be also associated with this. Uh, Frank Bertelmann has already alluded to this. Um, agriculture is simultaneously the major threat to the planetary boundaries, second largest contributor to climate change. If food loss was a country, it would be the third largest emitter after the US and China. It is also, agriculture is also the biggest contributor to biodiversity loss, soil loss, degradation, and water consumption. And at the same time, it is the sector that is very fully dependent on these resources, on soil and water and on biodiversity. And it is the one that is most exposed to the impacts of climate change. And to round off the picture, um, Agriculture continues to be the single biggest employer in the world. Uh, to many people in this global south, that is obvious. To many people in the north, it is not, uh, because their agriculture has uh, shrank so much as an employer. But one job in every four still is in agriculture. Now, if we look at who these people are, then the, one, the first finding is that many of them are poor. Um, the, the full estimate, the last full estimate that I'm aware of was made by the bank, the World Bank, uh, showing that 78% of all extreme poor live in rural areas. FAO also has numbers on hunger and many of the people who go hungry are actually farmers themselves. These people have a very high dependency on ecosystem services, much more so than their respective countries. If you look at the examples of Indonesia, India and Brazil there. And they are, for the most part, family farms. 400 million of them, they produce 80% of the good food in the global south, but three quarters of those holdings are smaller than one hectare. They are gardens more than farms in many instances. Now, here is something that is, um, I think, really critical to this debate that we're having, that value added in agriculture does not keep up anywhere in the world with value added in industry or services. That is true for high income countries where the ratio is about one to two. It is worse in Sub-Saharan Africa and in South Asia. There the ratio is even one to three. So agriculture is falling further and further behind uh, in economic development. In most countries, most African countries, Agriculture share in employment is twice as high as its share in uh, GDP, in gross domestic product, which means that on average, uh, farmers make half of the money that uh, the average person makes. So the situation is not good to start with. Now, if we consider demographic change and if we extrapolate trends a little bit into the future, 
we see that Asia is still in a phase of significant population growth and from a high base. Africa's growth, population growth is arguably only just starting. It is just accelerating. So South Asia um, has population growth of 1.9% per, labor force growth of 1.9% per year. Uh, in India, that translates into 10 million new job seekers every year arriving on the labor market. In Africa, the percentage growth is higher, but the base is still lower. Now the question is, where are all these people going? The traditional development model has is that we move people out of relatively unproductive agriculture and they move into more productive sectors, notably industry. The question is, is that happening in Africa and in South Asia? And the answer is no. What you see here is the evidence that uh, this Fox, Dr. Fox produced for, for Africa. FAO has uh, generated similar evidence for Asia. So this shift into a more productive employment elsewhere isn't happening. In fact, all of the global cells is suffering from what Dan Roderick calls premature deindustrialization. Industrial employment has already peaked in um, both regions and in Latin America too. So where does it leave us if uh, we cannot move people out of agriculture in any foreseeable, to any foreseeable degree, neither in South Africa, uh, neither in Sub-Saharan Africa, nor in South Asia. Uh, to me, it suggests that we have to think of ways that agriculture can retain labor. In Africa, it still does. It actually still absorbs labor. In Asia, the, it has started to shed labor. But if it does so massively, then those labor markets will be completely overwhelmed. It is already difficult. But if agriculture massively starts to shed labor because of climate disasters, for example, then it will be very, very difficult indeed. So what does it, could that transition mean? It would mean enhancing resilience and long-term sustainability, um, preserving biological diversity and ecosystem services, build on the natural processes to increase productivity of agriculture itself, safeguard a diverse which to me means a family farm structure in agriculture and improve the often very, very poor uh, work quality in agriculture and low productivity. And that would take a major transformation of agriculture itself, but also of production and consumption patterns in food. We don't have time to go into that, but I'm happy to entertain this in the discussion. A third necessary ingredient is that rural life must become more attractive to young people and there must be enabling policies for a broader rural development that will make that possible. On the image you see a, a Brazilian family um, sitting on the shores of the river Purus in the Amazon. Um, there, that is a farm family where the children have decided to stay um, because they have found a way of creating a productive environment that satisfies their needs, but they also have a school, they have electricity, they are members of a cooperative that helps them to get better access to markets. And this is where the, the green jobs come in as well. Uh, if we want sustainable agriculture, we need people who are able to do that. The generic definition of Green jobs is that they reduce environmental impact, they maintain ecosystem services, and they adapt, they help adapt to climate change. All of these things are obviously relevant and it's, it's not hard to think of the applications that that would have. Time doesn't allow this, but there is a formal definition of what green jobs are. And if you want to measure them, statisticians have thought about a way that you can do that. And you can find that under the link and that is provided here. Just to briefly say that green jobs are part of a broader transition to greener economies, to more sustainable economies, which require different new patterns of production and consumption, not only in agriculture, but also in other sectors. 
Some sectors will grow, others will stagnate or shrink in this transition. So that means that labor markets are changing in more ways um, than we have time to discuss here. What I'm focusing on is this question of green jobs, how many and which workers are needed to make the economy, or in this case, the agricultural and food sector greener. Let me try to, instead of staying on an abstract level to show some examples of what this means and what it could look like. Let's start with the bottom uh, picture. It is organic farming in India in a region that has suffered very heavily from so-called modern and high input farming. Um, people have turned back, gone back to organic farming, but modern types of organic farming to make their farms more productive and in the long term more sustainable also environmentally. And they do that without incurring the high input cost that the Green Revolution implies, which does actually improve output per hectare and sometimes output per work hour, but it does not much to increase farmers' incomes because so much of the uh, overall turnover goes into paying for the inputs. The upper picture is coffee farmers in Ethiopia. The Oromia Coffee Growers Association is uh, an example of how organization linked to uh, a market that functions differently can benefit populations and their environment. They achieve scale through cooperatives. It's a layered organization of cooperatives with a total of 200,000 members. They receive relatively fair prices because they, are, uh, they accumulate a lot of very high value coffee and they are a player in their own right on the market. They receive fair prices because they market it under uh, a fair trade arrangement. And from that, they make community investments which go into making rural life better and more attractive, health, education, internet access, et cetera. Green jobs can also look like this. The lady on the left on the upper picture is uh, the daughter of a farmer who was resettled in the Brazilian land reform by the military in the 1970s. They were dumped basically in the Amazon on relatively infertile land. That land quickly became unproductive once the trees were cleared. What they have decided uh, to do is to build agroforestry systems that would be maintaining soil fertility and that would offer a diversity of sources of income to uh, the producers. They have created a cooperative. Uh, they have built processing facilities on the spot. The lady is a trained forester. She provides now technical advice along with a young agricultural engineer who is also the son of a farmer uh, and who is now helping his own community with new knowledge that they have acquired. I think that is something that is um, really necessary and important that uh, not only do young people stay, but they bring something that is very clearly additional to their communities. Something that is also badly needed is much more local value added. Many of the agricultural produce that are produced, even if the productivity per hectare and per hour worked are high, it leaves a very tiny fraction of the total revenue with the original producer. And the only way to change that is to forego expensive inputs where you can and add as much local value as you can, for example, through processing. In this case, fish that was caught by part-time fishermen who are also farmers in the rivers of Peru. Green jobs can also be associated with creating those enabling env environments um, that uh, I mentioned earlier. One thing that many farmers lack is that they are 
they may be good technicians, they may be good organic farmers, they have a lot of traditional knowledge of their environments, but they lack entrepreneurial skills. They could make much better investments and they would be much less abused by financial intermediaries if and by their customers, <laughs> by their clients, if um, they had better entrepreneurial skills. And I think the, the idea in Vietnam to train massively farmers also as entrepreneurs in the One Million Farmers Project, for example, is a very good one. Social entrepreneurs are also something that would be a really, really good complement. Uh, it would help improve farming systems. It could help improve higher farm gate, get higher farm gate prices. It would enhance local value added. A number of programs um, like the one pictured at the bottom here uh, of young people in uh, various states in Brazil, in the Amazon, um, go through uh, academic training and they become social entrepreneurs as lawyers, as engineers, as um, uh, agronomists uh, to help um, their communities better navigate uh, global markets for food and for inputs. Finally, there's a huge opportunity and almost a crying need to link agriculture much better to social protection because agriculture needs resilience. And in the face of growing and more frequent extreme weather events, it's going to need that. You also need to target poverty relief in many cases and where you have an established protection system, you can do that. As we saw many of the people who are in rural areas are poor, including many, many farmers. And it all can also provide access to banking and to new markets and connect them. I wonder how this one goes down, but I, it, it strikes me as really important. When we have a discussion about technology, we seem to forget that the technologies that have historically led to the strongest and most lasting impact on productivity are not information technologies. It is not computers, it's not mobile phones, it's not the internet, but it's water and sanitation, it's efficient transport, and that meant railway, not airplanes. And it is access to modern energy, particularly electricity. And those technical revolutions have not taken place in many rural areas. And I think that's really good news because there's untapped potential there. Now, that could also help with um, the, with, it, it will also require actually the creation of green jobs, rural electricity is a case in point. Bangladesh has done this on a significant scale. Uh, and these ladies here, they have green jobs because they make those devices, they install them, they administer the credit that the families need in order to buy them. And they change completely the economic setting and the life realities of the people they reach because all of a sudden you have, you have light in the house, you can charge a mobile phone, you can, small, you can use a refrigerator, youth can study at night, etc. Something else that many, many rural areas are missing is adequate housing. And you can have eco-efficient, affordable housing that can be made by local builders. If they get trained, it, became, it can become one of those non-farm rural uh, sectors that are a good complement to the primary production in agriculture that provide different and complementary jobs to those that, that people find in agriculture. And finally, this link to social protection. It can take a range of different forms. I, the one that, that has the clearest immediate link to employment is the, non -rural, uh, the National Rural Employment Guarantee Act in India, uh, which benefits something to the tune of 60 million households every year. And if you look at where the investment goes, it goes into water conservation, it goes into irrigation, it goes into reforestation and the rehabilitation of water, water catchment areas. And this is part of green jobs uh, that is immediately beneficiary to, to farmers, but it also requires the technical skill to lay out, for example, infiltrating dams that permit water not to just run off, but to recharge uh, groundwater resources and to allow 
for it to be available for irrigation for a longer period of time. Just that was just a range of examples um, in the presentation that I think will be made available to those. There are the references, but I also have um, more on how you can do inventories and projections for green jobs creation, how the transition to a greener economy look more, more broadly in employment outcomes, and a number of country studies and regional studies that have sometimes interesting uh, information on agriculture and food, particularly the one for Latin America comes to mind. And finally, here is my contact. Thank you very much for giving me this opportunity. I look forward to our discussion. Thank you, Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Poshin. I think the, the 15, 20 minutes does not do justice to, to the wealth of information um, uh, that we've just received. Um, I won't try to, to summarize, but I, I do see um, you know, that uh, for green jobs, uh, there are you know, common things like institutions and policies that need to be put in place. And I, I saw um, the importance of cooperatives in many of your examples. And, uh, and also in terms of policy and investment gaps are um, you know, obviously skills and social protection and uh, infrastructure. Um, and the challenges of uh, livelihoods, um, so revenues for small scale farmers remains uh, still a, quite a big challenge despite you know, efforts uh, to improve productivity and, uh, and also the need to, to improve um, local value um, added uh, you know, processing and, and technologies. So, yeah, I think th there's so much uh, still to be said, and, and um, we hope this is just the beginning of, uh, of this discussion. Um, I, I think if Dr. Poshin can stay with us uh, a little bit more, then there is a, a, a open discussion uh, at the end of, of the next two presenters. So we'll collect some of the, the questions, um, and, and Dr. Poshin will still be with us, and so he can answer some, some questions. Um, so we have uh, with us also uh, very honored to have two uh, green job experts from ILO and FAO um, that will help us uh, get us get a better sense of uh, where the debate is, um, what are some of the lessons learned from very concrete programs uh, at country level. And uh, so I'm going to start with uh, introducing you to Mette Grangard Lund. Uh, Mete works um, in the Green Jobs Unit at the International Labour Organization, ILO, supporting constituents on topics of green jobs and just transition. In particular, in particular, she's covering work streams of private sector engagement, circular economy, and green jobs for youth. So thank you, Mete, for, um, for being with us, and uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and thank you uh, to Lisa as well for helping me uh, share the, the presentation. I appreciate that. Um, yes, and uh, thank you to Dr. Poshin for his uh, opening uh, statement. Um, I mean, uh, as uh, was mentioned in the introductions, um, Peter Poshin has been working uh, for the ILO for many years, so there might be a small overlap, but I think I was uh, quite uh, uh, we were good in coordinating, so um, I will focus um, a little more on some of the policy frameworks that we have in the ILO, uh, some policy recommendations, and then uh, lastly, some concrete uh, country examples um, that luckily do not uh, <laughs> overlap. Uh, but that also means that um, uh, I will uh, go a little bit quicker over some of the points on, uh, on the linkages uh, between climate change and the labor market. Uh, but I think uh, and hope that it will still be useful for, for everyone participating here. Um, so uh, Lisa, if you would please uh, go to the next slide. Uh, I would start with uh, just um, a quick uh, cont uh, contextualization. Um, I mean, Peter already uh, did uh, this uh, quite well, but uh, as, as was mentioned, um, 
many, many jobs and economic activities, they, they depend on stable climate and healthy environments. So uh, this is not the, the exception uh, in, in rural areas, on the contrary, where, where many uh, people depend on um, ecosystem services, such as uh, in, in sectors like agriculture, forestry, uh, fishing, tourism, uh, yeah, et cetera. Um, the ILO uh, numbers that we have show that uh, globally there is 1.2 uh, billion uh, workers that are depending on, on a healthy climate. And um, in some regions, as, as uh, Dr. Pashan already mentioned, uh, the dependency on, for example, agricultural uh, uh, practices uh, for, for livelihoods, for incomes, are, are really high. Um, and uh, and especially also for, for women. Um, and this is uh, particularly in, in a developing country context. Um, but but um, so that means that uh, when uh, women and, uh, and other uh, wise marginalized uh, po uh, populations are heavily um, employed in, for example, agriculture or some of the other uh, sectors I mentioned, uh, like forestry and fishing, they become increasingly more exposed to, to climate change and increasingly more so vulnerable. And that includes uh, youth uh, that we're focusing on today. And um, I think um, for um, a few ways that, uh, that, for example, they are particularly exposed would be through uh, climate change, but also environmental de uh, degradation. So this includes uh, droughts and flooding and, and global warming, and um, and that uh, uh, threatens agricultural processes, but also uh, those other uh, sectors I mentioned and those jobs that depend on them. Um, meanwhile, uh, when we do see so many people employed worldwide in agriculture, as Peter Prussian also mentioned, uh, agriculture is uh, and food waste is a, a huge. Uh, carbon uh, emitter. And that also means that there is uh, unsustainable agricultural uh, processes and deforestation significantly uh, contribute to the, the, the climate change and, and the threats that, uh, that uh, threaten their, their livelihoods. Um, so if we quickly go on to the, the next slide, uh, I wanna talk a little bit about how climate change uh, specifically impacts the labor market, right? So the jobs that we're talking about uh, today. Um, and you can see on, I guess it's uh, everyone's right, um, as, uh, as global warming is rising, natural disasters and, and uh, are increasing. Um, there will be um, increased exp and changing exposure to disease and heat stress. Um, and but also, as I said, uh, yeah, environmental disasters and, and, and changes such as uh, uh, in flooding, uh, droughts, etc. They they all um, uh, threaten the, these 1.2 billion jobs uh, globally that depend on them uh, on on ecosystem services. And um, this will res uh, result in a loss of work hours, a low, a lower labor productivity, climate migration. Um, and uh, we can, for example, in terms of productivity, we can see that due to heat stress, uh, there are many uh, places in the world where uh, both productivity will, will fall, but the uh, hours of the day where you can also uh, work safely uh, will also uh, reduce. And, um, and that uh, sets some different requirements to occupational health and safety and uh, both uh, the mitigation of climate change, but also that adaptation to it. Um, the research that we have in the ILO, it shows that uh, uh, climate change uh, will change and impact the labor market in several ways. Um, the, the narrative and the trends that we see is that globally, there will be a positive trend if we manage to uh, plan uh, ahead and uh, successfully respond in through policies to climate change. But in general, we'll see that there are, of course, some new jobs created, and, and those can be uh, jobs that we already talked about, basically uh, solar panel technicians, organic farmers, recycling managers, at, at all sorts of, of uh, levels of, of skills um, and, uh, and income. Uh, there are also some jobs that will become obsolete. Uh, these are primarily, yeah, uh, coal miners, uh, 
all uh, oil rigors, etc. But uh, the good thing is that uh, the majority of the change we'll see in the labor market is that the jobs will either be substituted or transformed. So that means that in a in a sustainability scenario where we have uh, clean energy and a circular economy, some hundred uh, million jobs will be created globally. And um, there will be uh, some jobs uh, destroyed uh, or up, become obsolete, but, but there is a net gain uh, to be made. And those jobs that um, are going to be lost, what is very important is for policymakers um, and uh, the actors of uh, the world of work uh, are um, preparing the labor market for, for this shift so that uh, jobs can be substituted or transformed, as I mentioned. So in the ILO, we have a policy framework uh, or some uh, um, uh, guidance for our constituents, uh, and that's on the next slide, which are the um, ILO Just Transition Guidelines. Um, and these guidelines are developed to support uh, governments, uh, workers, and employers' organizations in, in this transition towards uh, environmentally um, uh, sustainable uh, economies and societies uh, for all. So, uh, a just transition is basically ambitious uh, climate action coupled with social justice, decent work, um, social dialogue, etc. So the, the guidelines are split into nine different policy areas and they apply both to governments, but also, as I said, social partners. Um, and I have tried to split them up here uh, in, and group them a little bit. So uh, that uh, we can get a quick overview of them. But as you can see, a core pillar is policy coherence, coherence and social dialogue. Um, I'll talk a little bit about this in, in concrete policy interventions uh, in a minute. But other than that, uh, we it is a, a holistic approach looking at macroeconomic and industrial sectoral policies, enterprise development, skilling, reskilling, uh, active labor market policies, uh, occupational health and safety, and social protection that we have already talked a little bit about. Um, the guidelines, you can find them on, on the ILO's website, um, and they are quite uh, comprehensive, so uh, they are thought to be a, a guiding document uh, towards action. So let's move on to the next um, slide, where I have a few examples of just transition and rural economy policies. Um, so um, I won't go into to all of them in, in too big a detail because I've, I've also brought three uh, examples, uh, country examples. But um, as, as I mentioned, and, and uh, uh, there must be, um, we, uh, we must invest and promote uh, green jobs in, uh, in rural areas and rural sectors. I think uh, Peter Poshin had a very good uh, point in terms of the diversification uh, of the rural economy. Um, some of the, the ILO um, uh, experience shows that, that it's really important to invest in, in non-agricultural uh, um, sectors and jobs. Uh, so the diversification of the types of jobs in rural areas really important also in order to ensure that there are different kinds of jobs for different skill sets and levels of, of skill sets, um, which is the, the third point here. So, so boosting the skills. And this is both for uh, young workers but, but, uh, and, and future workers, but also for existing workers. So that's, a, again, going back to, uh, to uh, those uh, shifts we see in the labor market, it's important that we plan ahead and that uh, those that uh, those jobs that will become obsolete, that there are uh, alternatives uh, in, in the labor market. Um, then uh, we have the social protection element, which I was very happy to see mentioned before. I have a concrete example uh, on that as well, but it's uh, it's really important because as we see the, the climate change uh, or climate related risks. Uh, are increasing, so uh, it's uh, important that um, people uh, have a security and safety net and um, have the, the possibility to, uh, for example, shift their agricultural practices or invest in uh, higher uh, value added uh, crops, etc. And if the risk of losing your entire yield uh, due to climate change is too high and you do not have any uh, protection systems, 
then uh, then that shift will never happen. So it's a, an important tool in supporting this just transition. Um, then uh, we also talked about occupational health and safety. Um, I won't dwell too much on this, but uh, but basically it is important that the labor market adapts to the new circumstances. Uh, productivity does uh, fall as temperatures rise, and there is a significant um, uh, fatality uh, linked to, to uh, heat stress. So this is an, a very serious problem that must be, be addressed. Um, and then the last one on social dialogue. I think this one is uh, key, of course, to, to the ILO, but also to ensuring that um, we support formalization of the labor market, that we support a decent job creation, but also um, that uh, social dialogue is really cross-cutting on all those areas, for example, in terms of skills, ensuring employable skills, a closer link between uh, the schools and the labor market. Uh, that's just one example, but, but social dialogue we really see as a tool in, uh, to, to reach those goals. I want to go to the last slide, which are three examples. Um, I have uh, an example on social protection, one on green entrepreneurship, and then uh, one on employment promotion. So I'll be quick. The first one is from the Philippines, where the ILO supported a, a project um, in where the, the aim was to give uh, the, the vulnerable populations, the rural populations, uh, increased access, access to both financial and productive uh, resources uh, to cope with these adverse impacts of, of climate-related risks. And specifically, the one I want to highlight is this weather index-based uh, insurance, uh, which helped uh, smallholder farmers uh, to, to mitigate some of those risks uh, related to weather conditions. So um, by being insured, uh, farmers uh, have more of an incentive uh, to, to increase investments in their farms, uh, to crop, to grow crops with higher value and, and still be protected against any natural um, disasters. So for example, in the picture I have here, this is Myrna. She's a rice farmer in the Philippines and um, her uh, yield, uh, her, her crops, are both in the risk of, of droughts and, and flooding. Uh, so she's become a very strong um, uh, ally for, for this uh, insurance, uh, promoting it to all her friends because uh, through this uh, cooperative structure, uh, she, she was able to pay, uh, obtain a, 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 an insurance um, which was uh, only, only had 1% uh, interest uh, compared to uh, uh, the current uh, insurance that she had, which was a 7% uh, insurance. Um, so uh, unfortunately, she was, her, her crops were uh, hit uh, by, by droughts. She lost 40% uh, of, of uh, their yield, but, but she was able to recover um, a, a substantial, almost 90% uh, um, of the, the, the insurance that she had, um, had, uh, had invested in. So um, that's a good example. Um, yeah. Sorry, as, as we're, we're running a little bit behind. Oh, schedule. sorry. Um, no, it's okay. It's super interesting, but maybe we can keep it to one example and then, yeah. uh, and then maybe open it during the, sort of the panel discussions. Uh, yeah, for sure. I'll be happy to. Yeah, uh, But I'll let you wrap up. I mean, I don't want to abruptly, but just uh, <laughs> thank you so much. All right, uh, I'll skip the one on entrepreneurship, and then I just wanted to say that um, the, the last example, which wasn't really touched upon before, is the, this uh, uh, support for the transition and finding jobs, right? So the last example here is from, from Egypt, where uh, the ILO also together with Canada uh, supported a job creation in rural areas of Egypt. Uh, in several ways. Uh, there was some entrepreneurship training and some job readiness training, but what I wanted to, to really highlight was this um, uh, job center, uh, which was targeting uh, women in the area. And it was this, uh, it was called a job search club. And the women were trained both in writing a CV, but also how to do interviews, etc. And in that way, 50% uh, of the participants in this job search club found a job through through that uh, club. 
um, which I think is also another good example and good lesson learned. So I'll pause here and I apologize that I was uh, a bit uh, long, but thanks. No, no, Mette, you, you did well. I think we're all little bit, little bit accumulating. <laughs> Uh, some some time loss, but uh, thank you so much. I think uh, your your uh, you brought in this uh, the aspect of uh, the green transition, which uh, which is basically going beyond just uh, the green job aspect, but uh, the need to to really consider the impact of uh, transition on the labor market, which um, is not necessarily just creating green jobs, but will also destroy jobs in certain sectors and therefore how to how do we make sure we have a system systemic uh, thinking uh, as we do this transition um, so um, but more concretely we have uh, Jonga who will uh, who will share with us uh, some uh, some more examples uh, from from their projects um, so Jonga uh, Kim is a program officer in the Decent Rural Employment Team of the FAO, Food and Agriculture Organization, and she currently co coordinates the Green Jobs for Rural Youth Employment Project, uh, which aims to provide wage employment and entrepreneurship opportunities to rural youth in Sierra Leone, Timor-Leste, and Zimbabwe. And she's also supporting uh, Green Jobs uh, projects in Palestine, Uzbekistan, and Vietnam. And Chang'a will um, unpack some of the myth about green jobs uh, and share her experience with FAO's uh, program. Chang'a, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Fionn, for, for the introductions and also for the preceding presenters. Um, since the, the previous uh, presenters have already contextualized green jobs against the backdrop of, of um, um, decent work and, and also uh, sustainable development, um, allow me to jump right into sharing with you some of the recurring challenges and the ways to address uh, some of the pathways that we've found to green jobs in agricultural um, and agri-food systems uh, for the for the rural youth. And so, yeah, the, the need and opportunity is clear. We we need to provide decent work in agri-food systems that are also environmentally sustainable, and therefore uh, we we need green jobs. Uh, I won't go into too much uh, technical details about this because I think the the previous um, presentations have covered them thoroughly. Um, the, the three major challenges I've we've we've come across. Let me start with the first one. Um, the the biggest and initial hurdle that that we have to overcome is is the misconception of what green jobs are. And and I'm glad to see that in the in the discussion there's already uh, a lot of questions being raised on this, because um, many of the initial reactions allude to green jobs necessitating some kind of high technology or a lot of capital investment, um, preferably from governments or or donor agencies and therefore are seen as something that's expensive and not, not applicable, especially to the poor rural youth. And that's why some of the common responses from our partner governments is that um, we, we need jobs first, whether they're brown or green or, or, or decent or not, we, we just need jobs for our youth because they're desperate and, and they're in poverty. So we'll take any jobs. Um, and, and so this, this green jobs that's being linked to, to these all these like farming dr drones and robots and, and often cited digital agriculture are some of the examples that people think of when they hear green jobs. But, but we first have to clarify that what we aim for, however, it's, it's not to address these job deficit by artificially and temporarily providing or introducing jobs through seed money or some sort of short-term employment opportunities. Because evidence has already shown that jobs that are specifically only targeting youth for the sake of addressing youth employment, without really going into the larger economic context of job unavailability in the first place, tend to fade out quickly after the project and the funding dries up. So, and, and instead of quote unquote bringing jobs, uh, we, we firmly state that job opportunities should be identified. And the best way to do this economically and also environmentally in a sustainable manner is to, to green the value chains um, within the existing labor market. And, and that is basically going lower input, lower cost uh, whenever you can and shortening the supply chains using practices that are resource and time efficient through principles like nature-based solutions and, and circular economies and such. Um, so when, when we refer to green jobs in agri-food systems, we're not talking about a certain jobs 
or certain technologies that we want to promote, but but that that these green jobs opportunities are are to be identified across various spectrum of of both low and high skill work. And and the reason I, I mentioned the skills in work is because the second challenge that we come across is is the skills mismatch. Uh, once we get past the misconception, we have another huge hurdle that is the gigantic issue of of skills mismatch in rural areas that are further exacerbated by the expectations that rural youth and the communities have for green jobs. And, and because uh, these uh, better and decent jobs are thought to be mainly white collar jobs with managerial roles involving little to no physical work, the, the conception among youth participants is that there's, it's, it's a lot of a desk job outside the agri-food systems. Uh, and and when you couple that with with the rural youth in developing countries having one of the widest career aspiration gaps, and and that is that they tend to have they tend to be underqualified for the jobs that they have, but at the same time they they overrate their their skills level for their prospective jobs. So it can be really sobering experience for them to realize that green jobs can also include low skill work work as well. And, and what you're seeing on the screen right now is, is, is from an OECD study that shows exactly this, that uh, rural youth, especially in developing economies, in the agricultural sectors, there is a pervasive career aspiration gap that you can see as represented by the dark blue bar in the, in, among the surveyed countries. Um, so, and, and last but not least, the, the biggest challenge <laughs> that we also have to address has got nothing to do actually with, with decent work or environmental sus sustainability, but, but more with um, the perception of the relevant stakeholders and policymakers on, on what they wish for technology and innovation to be and how it will make everything youth-friendly and green in agri-food systems. And, and their, their logic is, is that agricultural sectors are seen as unattractive to youth because of decent work deficit, which is, which is true. And, and, but, but then, so that work needs to be made more attractive by introducing technology and innovation, and because youth are drawn to that, and those youth will be brought back to agriculture. Uh, there's there's a lot of unpack to there's a lot to unpack here, but but this this supposed youth penchant for innovation also provides fodder for why entrepreneurship is sort of hailed as the default mode for a lot of these rural poverty reduction programs uh, that that specifically target youth. What what we want to clarify uh, through our interventions is that um, first, uh, really simply, like agricultural machineries, um, they they increase productivity under certain circumstances such as where where there's real wage um of of agricultural workers that have steeply increased and land succession is not taking place and therefore actually introducing machinery addresses the labor deficit that could that that leads that have shown to lead to productivity increase but this is not the case in many of the african countries and only applies to some countries in asia let alone in latin america where small land uh smallholder farmers tend to to start out with larger, larger size of land in the first place. Um, another thing is that youth are still involved in agriculture. Um, of, of course, they're more fluid in leaving the sector, but but they're they're already more engaged than is visible through unpaid family labor and and seasonal informal work. And these youth, being the landless workers that they are, giving them technology and machines and quote unquote innovations where they have no physical place to exert them won't really fundamentally address any decent work deficits. Um, we also want to take into consideration the potential labor displacing effects of technology, because if these technologies are sort of paved in um, to the low and middle skill labor market with well well intentions from the government and, and donors, but but without really taking into due consideration the the uh, elimination of, of certain tasks or jobs, this can actually exacerbate the, the work deficit issue. So we, we have a whole line of research dedicated to, to preventing this, but in one line summary, we have to be very deliberate and careful about the technologies that we want to bring in and what kind of impact that they will have. Um, Last but not least, the importance of wage employment opportunities. Uh, I will I will address that further in the in the coming slide. Uh, so what then? Uh, oh, sorry. How does FAO want to actually address these challenges? How can we address them while providing green jobs in the agri-food system? Um, 
I, I will, for, for the sake of limited time, I'll just uh, introduce three approaches that we have. Um, what first is that unless you have already identified the exact gap in mechanization or digitalization, we, we want to avoid from going in with a preset a uh, particular set of jobs or particular technology or particular machines, because otherwise the jobs will disappear shortly after the project funding dries up and machines and technology, we've seen them all sitting idle in, in community um, repositories and stuff. And we don't want to repeat that. How do we avoid that from happening? Uh, we, we first want to emphasize the, the role that youth participants have in identifying what the problems that they want to work on and how they can propose to, to solve these, these issues. And, and this problem identification and problem solving skills is one of the, the key soft skills that rural youth in particular have been observed to lack according to ILO school to work transition surveys, which is why we dedicated an entire module in our soft skills training to, to foster and hone their skills for, for this. Um, so, as you see in the, in the right side of the workflow uh, of the presentation, our workflow, the, the youth submitting their green job solution in form of business and work plan is the most critical step of our approach because the rest of, of our feasibility studies to, to make sure that this can actually be sustainable and can be financed, all is based on what the youth want to work on. Um, moving quickly on to the next. Uh, approach. We want to combine the skills development opportunities with actual job or business opportunities because they, they're made more sustainable when they're provided in tandem. So skills development opportunities are critical, but when you leave them without concrete job opportunities to follow, follow it, can, it can sort of leave the youth in dismay after seeing that they're, they, they can't put that, that skill to use. Um, and lastly, we want to make a case for wage employment in agri-food systems, especially if you want to provide work opportunities to youth that, that are traditionally left out or, or very much pinched on time. And in particular, female, Euro, uh, female rural youth, um, regardless of the, the social gender roles that hinder them from participating in the first place, they're, they're swamped with various caring responsibilities at home and at farms. And by providing wage employment opportunities, those that have not had the experience or propensity or time to, to self-employ or to employ, employ others can also engage in these green jobs opportunities, which we definitely would not want to miss. Um, if you also add the option of going part-time, that's, that's even better. And, and then I'm, I'm glad that Matt had also mentioned and also Dr. Potion had mentioned the, the social protection component of it, but that, that also can, can come in nicely with, with the uh, wage employment opportunities that we provide to youth so that it's not just limited to entrepreneurial youth who can dedicate full-time uh, their time and attention to, to these, these opportunities that rise. Um, I would like to leave more room for, for your inputs and, and discussion. So I'll, I'll just um, stop here, but, but the, these three our approaches that I've shared with you today are only part of the whole package that is the, the green jobs for rural youth at FAO. And, and we have many more facets that we, we would like to cover, such as the impact assessment of the technologies in, in local labor markets and, and also the automation and digitalization trends in agricultural food systems. And also the, the green technologies and practices themselves that, that actually make these green jobs uh, green uh, these these decent work opportunities um, um, green jobs for for the rural youth. So we we look forward to exploring these these more options and and other aspects uh, in the in the discussion session. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chonga, uh, for this very rich presentation. Again, I think. Uh, Really, we should have planned for a uh, you know three-hour <laughs> webinar because there's so much uh, more to be said. Um, I uh, I'm gonna uh, still open it for for a, a small Q and A uh, session before going to the roundtable. Um, I saw I saw many questions regarding to the green jobs uh, definition. I to be honest, I, I, I purposely did not want to go into this debate because I mean I I, I don't think. We want to try and define green jobs here, uh, but there is one maybe 
uh, through one question, maybe <laughs> someone, uh, but maybe Dr. Poshin can can um, can elaborate a bit. Uh, I think Syriac, uh, is it Syriac who asked, uh, is green farming uh, equal organic farming, uh, and are you using this interchangeably? Um, and I and I think um, I don't know, Syriac. Do you want to do you want to ask? Because it, there are many linked questions in your in your chat uh, to both Chonga and I think uh, Dr. Poshton about the definition of green jobs. Uh, maybe some a, a specific questions that wasn't clear for you. Um, if you want to come in, please feel free. Otherwise, I'll let Dr. Poshin uh, answer that question. Uh, th thank you, thank you so much, uh, GN. Um, <laughs> It's very fascinating. I mean, to listening to three presenters now, um, it, uh, I mean, what one, one, one day for talking the same animal here. And uh, um, uh, I mean, Peter was in his presentation, he uses the, uh, the, green, the green production or green jobs interchangeably with uh, organic farming. And uh, he mentioned that there's other options. Uh, um, organic farming is one of is one of the package, and I'm wondering if we can elaborate a little bit on those other options that may constitute as a you know or might, might be characterized as a green um, green production system. Uh, and again, I would really like to hear from uh, Jonga uh, his his her argument around the shift towards a much more high tech capital intensive you know kind of uh, uh, farming in the green economy and how do we reconcile peter's uh, view and the jonga's view on that on that because the the two views in my opinion it seems to be diametrically completely you know different Um, maybe if I may just come in to clarify, because I think it's a simple one. Um, Syriac, I'm, I'm sorry if I if I caused confusion, but what I meant to clarify was was the the misconception around green jobs being only high tech and and capital intensive. And so what I was trying to show was there there are other um, less capital intensive and um, um, low cost, low input green jobs that are available for low skilled youth as well. So it's not just um, expensive and, and high tech green jobs only, contrary to, to some of the popular notion. I hope that clarifies. Please go ahead, Dr. Pashin. Yeah, thank you. Um, <laughs> This definition question to me is um, is really a red herring. Um, I, of course, you can be very Cartesian about it, and you can debate this question forever and ever. I think the the the, the key no the key point is that making agriculture or any economic sector more sustainable will require certain skills, and in the absence of these skills, and people willing to deploy those skills in a situation, it will not happen. And, it, and you can, this happen, This is a situation the world over and in any economic sector you can think of. It has been a challenge for renewables in China, for uh, green buildings everywhere, uh, for uh, agriculture in Australia. It, 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 so it, the, the, the question is really what in a given situation how can you make agriculture and the food system more sustainable? What are the options? I mean, uh, you know, I started to discuss technology. You know, what what is what is the trajectory that you? What is the the modus operandi that you think uh, might work, or that the the locals, uh, those who are involved in this, think might work? And and there you can anticipate actually what skills will it take to do this? And so that you do not hit this bottleneck of skills only once you, you would like, once an investment is being made and once you would, have, would like to hire somebody who knows how to do this, you have to do this earlier. It has to be part of the design. And that is, that is what makes um, 
this idea of the green jobs really uh, important and crucial to this transformation. In terms of labor market outcomes, it's the proportions vary depending on the country that you're in and depending on the sector that you're in. I think that 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 that's a different debate. You know, uh, are we solving the labor market prop the labor market problem with the green jobs? I personally think no, we will not. But without the green jobs, we're only going to get going to get things becoming worse. You know? And and the practical definitions have been adopted in in different countries for their own purposes. We have investment programs that go into billions that have decided on what they think is greener, a greener course of action than, than what the business as user would have been. And, and they orient those investments as a function of that. So it's, it's a matter of, of getting an agreement about it, not being too Cartesian, I think. Can I just say two words on this? I, I really uh, quite agree. And I also think someone mentioned in the in the chat that they don't see it, that uh, we're necessarily using three different uh, definitions of uh, green jobs. I, uh, I think what is really a key takeaway is that a, a green job doesn't necessarily have to be in, a, as Peter says, a traditional green sector. They can be in all sectors. They can be, as uh, Junga says, uh, across all types of skill sets. Uh, it does, it's, doesn't have to be highly skilled uh, workers, etc. And then I will just uh, mention the last thing, which is the one that is really important to the ILO, is that we, when we talk about promoting green jobs, we have to uh, consider that they should be decent jobs. So that's why in the ILO definition, we consider green jobs as decent jobs. So I don't say recent and de decent jobs, because in our definition, that is included. But in the reality, of course, that's not how it is. There are uh, plenty of green jobs in a circular economy that are not decent. So that's uh, that's just the last little element I wanted to add to this discussion, um, and and then uh, I understand we shouldn't uh, <laughs> discuss uh, the definitions anymore. But it's very important to change that the fact that they're not decent because otherwise mm -hmm. these jobs will not last. If farmers cannot make a good enough income and if they do not have a decent life, you they will not stay in farming. This can be as organic as you want will have it, you no, know, as sustainable as it gets, you no, know, but it, they will not stay there. So the, the decent part is not optional. It's a neat, it is something that you may have to work on that you only get to gradually, but it is really essential. Okay, let me, um, I think we still have some opportunities for, for, for uh, discussion, but I have still four great panelists uh, who have been patiently, um, you know, uh, waiting to also share their views. So I'm gonna to move to the round table um, discussion and, and, and focus back the discussion on agri-food system. And I know green jobs can happen anywhere, but we're here today trying to focus on agri-food system. Um, at the OECD, we, we also recently published a, a report on jobs for rural youth, which uh, looked, uh, we, we calculated a forecast for 2030 for 11 sub-Saharan African countries in the agri-food sector using a really business as usual, usual scenario without any further investment, just looking at population growth and income growth. And, uh, and we expect 115 million jobs in the food economy, uh, including production and the downstream activities. And that's basically about a 20% increase uh, from 2019. Um, they're both green and non-green jobs. And uh, it was mentioned earlier by, by, by um, earlier speakers, how jobs in rural areas uh, or in the agri-food sector are unsustainable uh, if they're not uh, decent, but also if there are no structural transformation happening um, uh, at the same time. Um, so um, how can we reconcile um, economic, social, and environmental objectives uh, in the agri-food system so that they can create decent and green jobs for rural youth? Um, so for, for, uh, for this round table, I have uh, four great speakers who will represent uh, each uh, different views. Uh, I have Faustina Obeng Adoma. She's a critical geographer whose work is at the intersection of micro and macro level agrarian changes in rural Africa. She's also a member of the network of young African researchers in agriculture. Faustina, you have the big responsibility of representing uh, the whole of youth today. <laughs> Um, then we have uh, Dr. Janet Edeme, who is uh, the head of rural 
Development Division in the Department of Agriculture, Rural Development, Blue Economy and Sustainable Environment of the African Union Commission. And her division also coordinates the implementation of the African Union Continental Agribusiness Strategy and the African Agribusiness Youth Strategy. Um, we have with us also Jane Lowicki Zuka. She's the senior youth advisor within the USAID, um, the, the, the American Aid, Aid, Aid Agency. Um, it's Bureau for Resilience and Food Security, where she works to strengthen the agency's efforts to engage youth in inclusive agriculture-led growth, nutrition, resilience, and water security, sanitation, and hygiene activities. And finally, but not least, Michael Sudarkasa is the CEO of Africa Business Group. Africa Business Group is a South African-based uh, um, company, but working throughout the continent to promote private sector development, trade and investment within, within Africa, but also between Africa and the global business community. Um, so I'm gonna start with, uh, with Faustina. Faustina, so what are uh, young people expecting when it comes to green jobs in agriculture and agri-food systems more generally? Does, does green jobs speak to them? What are their expectations? Um, you know, of course, don't feel pressured to represent the youth speak from your own experience. Thank you. Thank you, Gion. So um, I'll try to start by saying that in terms of what green jobs mean to, for, for these young people or what are, they are expecting in terms of agriculture or the agri-food system, I would say that there exists a diversity of expectations. And these are based on diverse contextual realities, right? So in terms of their resource endowments, in terms of their aspirations, and whether these young people are more entrepreneurial or they are seeking wage employment within green ventures. So I'll give a couple of examples. So for young people who are already engaged in some sort of production from small to medium scale, but using conventional practices in this production of post-harvest processing, for many of them, they have seen that um, current and future climate scenarios, for instance, would no longer support the conventional practices. And so for these set of young people, the expectation is that green jobs or green ventures would, would involve some sort of gradual, incremental or transformative adaptation of their existing production or processing practices to make their activities that you already engage in more climate smart. So for these people, they are expecting some sort of skill set in how to actually implement climate smart agriculture, for instance, in their production or processing activities, but also that these climate smart practices are accompanied by the needed climate information services, or sometimes um, accompanied by knowledge and information on one health. And when I say one health, these people are looking for practices that can improve soil health, water health, animal health, and human health in that holistic manner. And they are also seeking for some sort of market information for the kinds of activities that they want to transition into. But what we also realize is that these young people are not seeking for diverse ways of assessing these diverse um, kinds of services or information, but that the climate smart practices together with climate information services, One Health and maybe market information are bundled into some sort of product that is accompanied by a sustainable finance um, option that can facilitate their easy transition into some sort of green venture. Then they also expect that because resource endowments are different, and this could be as a result of their level of education, but also the, the gender dynamics in the context that they are, they are operating. The expectation is that beyond these bundles being youth smart, they should also be gender smart. And when we say gender smart, people are looking for, for bundles or practices that have lower implementation requirements, that have lower associated drudgery, that is also acceptable within the current sociocultural system that they find themselves in, so that they can transition their existing practices into green, green ventures. And there are also a set of young people that have already started or are hoping to start new green ventures, quote unquote, with their own investment. And for these set of youth, 
these green ventures include production of biopesticides or organic fertilizers that can feed into other forms of green production, or those who are already or going into organic food production, as well as those who are engaged in some sort of circular food production. And the common one we see around here, although not on a, on a larger scale, are fish rice systems. So for these people, the expectation is some sort of an enabling environment within the rural economy for such ventures to be viable. And this includes support systems for that, that, can, that can link to both the production and then the market side to facilitate the kind of green ventures that they are already in or going into. And then there's also a bit of expectation on a certain policy regime that would make these green ventures competitive to conventional ventures or better still that, that the policy framework that gradually shifts the agri-food economy towards a more green economy with some sort of credit and financial system that is sensitive to green investment. Then there are others that are also looking for actual skills from high tech skills to skills that would easily allow them to be able to seek for employment in green ventures. And for these people, the skills they are looking for includes green extension, green farming, green processing, but also how to really recycle the byproducts of these agricultural produce or processing. And for these people, beyond they looking for the work, and I, I, this thing has come up again, a green venture would not only offer an employment, but an employment that is actually decent with acceptable working conditions. And what these acceptable conditions are varies a lot in terms of the, the few examples that we have. But the general expectation that is that these conditions should be better than the, the precarity or the casualizations and the low wages that are typical of conventional food production and proce processing ventures. So there are diversity of expectations. And in terms of whether green jobs speak to these rural youth, yes, again, it speaks to them, but also in diverse ways based on what is meaningful to their, their diverse reporters and aspirations. For those that are seeking for, for to start new ventures, Green Jobs speaks to many of them in some sort of holistic sense of seeing opportunities to create niche markets where they hope that the green ventures can thrive and possibly coexist with current conventional ventures or eventually overtake these conventional systems. And for these people, they, they, they are concerned about making their ventures green right from idea conceptualization to the implementation requirements, including the skills whether they can apply themselves or they are employed, they can employ the, the right skill set for their, their ventures, but also to also find out the sale of the final products within the market. And these young people usually would go into some sort of incubator programs to find like-minded people that they can partner with or find matching grants to set up these enterprises. Then there are others who Green Jobs speaks to them for specific instrumental reasons, and that includes if green jobs offers an alternative means of solving a particular challenge that they have dealt with for a while. And this we see, especially within production systems that are currently struggling with climate variability or extreme climate events. And also for, for vegetable production that is struggling currently because of resistance of pests to chemical um, pesticides. And so, these young people are looking for alternatives. And fortunately, the alternative is found within the, the green economy. And there are others that Green Job also speak to them from a purely um, sort of moral perspective. And these people are looking for skill set that they can use to support green ventures for the broad purpose of enhancing planetary health. So I think I, I would end here. Yeah. There are just a diversity of aspirations and what mm -hmm. young people expect. So thank Thanks, you. Thanks, Faustina. The, for just listening from uh, what you're saying, I feel like young people um, are living the myth a bit of <laughs> what Jonga was saying about you know green jobs being uh, necessarily linked to high tech and or some kind of tech and green venture and 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 sort of capital investment um, so i feel like the aspirations are are maybe um, quite high uh, when it comes to, to, to green jobs um, so having said that this is a nice link to 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 my next question to uh, to janet uh, which is about um, you know can we have green jobs uh, without a sort of an overall green uh, strategy and green uh, economy um, 
and, and a sort of a public commitment towards uh, this transition. And uh, how much public investment uh, do you see among your AU uh, you know, African Union members? And what is the overall sentiment with um, amongst the AU members regarding the, the, this transition in, uh, in the agri-food sector? Okay, thank you very much, um, Jiyun, and good afternoon uh, to our keynote speaker, uh, fellow panelists, and uh, ladies and gentlemen. And thank you very much also for inviting the African Union Commission uh, to participate in this um, very interesting and very exciting um, webinar. Uh, let me first begin by stating that the concept of the green economy is emerging as a hopeful solution to the multiple challenges uh, you know, the continent also faces, uh, challenges of climate change, of poverty alleviation, and inequality while also enabling our African Union member states uh, to create uh, decent jobs and also to accomplish an inclusive economic transformation. And this transformation is anticipated to create a new, to create new green jobs. And uh, for this reason, it is widely heralded as a solution to the uh, youth employment um, crisis on our continent. And the challenge for our African Union member states is that a green transformation of the economy will destroy and displace existing jobs even as it creates new ones. And uh, this is bound to be quite disruptive even if the eventual out outcomes are generally expected to be positive. Uh, but in spite of its diverse interpretations, the concepts we understand of the green jobs and green economy is very important uh, because it helps to reinvigorate um, existing debates and also challenge existing pathways uh, to the achievement of sustainable development. However, we are looking at inclusive uh, green economy as approaches it should not mean choosing between growth, social progress, or environmental sustainability. So with strong planning and coordinated policy frameworks, uh, we believe that inclusive green economies could be built, which also reduce inequalities and will promote social well-being. A green jobs approach uh, for our youth, uh, we expect it to incorporate three key principles of the decent jobs agenda. And this would comprise um, strategies that would support uh, green economic growth and decent job creation, supporting our youth to build skills that are relevant to the green job market, and also improving um, income security within innovative uh, social protection systems. And just like other youth across uh, the globe, uh, young Africans are also interested um, in ICT and innovative modern farming techniques. Young people have the potential uh, to contribute to sustainable climate smart farming techniques and to a food secure continent and also global economies. Uh, by leapfrogging, as we don't think there is a need for us to invent the wheel, uh, particularly in commercial farming, and also by integrating and adapting modern farming practices based on our local context, the African youth can also contribute to creating uh, these sustainable um, green jobs. The second question with regards to how much public investments uh, going towards um, green economy programs that may also include a focus on green employment in Africa. Our continent is in the eye of a triple storm. Uh, the last half decade has been extremely challenging from a climate perspective. We, you know, we might recognize or realize or remember uh, the cyclone Idai, which took place in Mozambique to the heavy snowfalls in North Africa, desert locusts, fall armyworm that was ravaging crops across East and Southern Africa to floods in Ghana and other countries in West Africa. And also the repercussions of climate change have been felt across the continent. And very recently as well, uh, we do recall the, the floods that took place in KwaZulu-Natal um, in South Africa. And the economic and health costs of climate change are already acknowledged uh, globally. And our continent is already spending about $335 billion annually, which is equivalent to more than 5% of the continent's GDP to respond to climate uh, disasters. Uh, despite uh, our satisfactory response to the COVID-19 pandemic, Africa has lost over 30 million jobs. Uh, poverty is once again on the rise and debt pressures are mounting. So a swift and bold response is needed uh, to address the devastating impacts of the climate, health, and economic crisis. Our African Union finance ministers have called for an injection of external assistance 
of about $100 billion each year for the next three years to close the financing gap of more than 345 billion US dollars that has been identified by the IMF. And equally, the IMF uh, two years ago had said that between, we need about 30 to 50 billion US dollars a year in incremental finance would be needed for climate adaptation in Sub-Saharan Africa alone. And however, the COVID-19 crisis is also expected to set back our external private finance to developing countries by about $700 billion, which will be a 60% drop uh, than after the 2008 to 2009 financial crisis. Your third question in terms of um, what's been discussed among our African Union member states. Uh, the prolonged youth employment crisis, particularly the numbers of youth uh, not in employment, education or training, implies an underutilized productive potential in the economy, as well as thwarted aspirations of millions of our young people with the potential of long-term negative impacts. And, and we all are aware that widespread unemployment would also create an imbalance in economy. And this is also expressed in adverse effects such as price volatility, the food insecurity, disease risks, poverty, and a very weak uh, social cohesion. The African Union has put in place various policy responses to the youth employment um, crisis, ranging from, you might be aware of the Auda NEPAD's uh, 2004 strategic framework for youth, which targeted youth employment, the 2006 African Youth Charter, which has prioritized um, poverty eradication, socioeconomic integration of youth, and sustainable livelihoods and youth employment. Uh, we also have um, the Youth Envoy. We also have a, an AU Youth Envoy who also uh, sits in the office of the chairperson and has been a very strong advocate in terms of um, pushing the youth agenda at the continental um, level. And very recently, uh, during the FAO African Regional Conference that took place about two weeks ago in um, Equatorial Guinea, Malabo, Equatorial Guinea, we launched um, an FAO AUC investment guidelines for youth in agri-food um, systems. So we expect that these guidelines have also got some components on how we could begin to green our economy and make the economy provide programs and jobs that are youth sensitive and also green sensitive. And so we are also using this guideline for our African Union members from um, national youth policies that are intended to address the, um, the youth employment challenges. And then um, to support all of these efforts as well, our member states and our regional economic uh, commissions and also the, the AUC itself, we have developed what we call the Green Recovery Action Plan, GRAP for short, it's a seven year plan. Uh, which intends to tackle the combined challenges of the COVID-19 recovery and also the climate change by focusing on a few critical areas. Uh, we're looking at issues of climate, including climate finance uh, within the plan, uh, renewable energy, resilient agriculture, uh, green jobs, resilience and biodiversity. And one of the five priority intervention areas of this recovery action plan is building a resilient agriculture by focusing on inclusive economic development and green jobs. And under this uh, recovery action plan, uh, while the commission is going to be providing the overall coordination for the implementation of this plan at the continental level, and also providing um, strategic guidance for its domestication, our African Union member states will be implementing and also providing information on the five intervention areas of the green recovery action plan, which I had mentioned earlier. So we'll be looking at how we can support uh, renewable energy and energy efficiency, uh, nature-based solutions and biodiversity, uh, looking at green and resilient um, cities with a focus on water, flooding and water resources. And I had mentioned the challenge that South Africa is uh, presently undergoing because of the flooding in Durban and within the uh, KwaZulu Natal areas and also the, um, the climate finance. Mm -hmm. So I don't know how much time I have left. I would want to be. Um, yeah, yeah. So thanks, uh, Janet. I think we will um, uh, go uh, 15 minutes over. <laughs> just to find this really. Uh, oh, OK. I, yeah. I, I but, was just but, about uh, to conclude. Ah, OK, great. Thanks. Yes, so, I was just about to conclude, uh, just to give some more time as well to my fellow panelists. Mm -hmm. uh, so in conclusion, um, it's important for us to note that developing policies and strategies 
and getting political buy-in is a critical step forward, but it is insufficient for us to be able to achieve a green transition on our continent. Transitioning to a green economy requires directing adequate public and private investments. However, the fiscal space to enable such investments is severely limited for our African Union member states, particularly in the wake of the COVID-19 pandemic. Mm -hmm. For instance, uh, um, according to Ethiopia's uh, climate resilient uh, green economy, green strategy, building a green economy re would require an estimated total expenditure of about 150 billion US dollars over a 20 year period. And furthermore, according to the International Atomic Energy Agency, in Sub-Saharan Africa, around 620 million people uh, lack access to electricity and nearly 730 million are still relying on burning biomass like wood for cooking. So the challenge for our government is how we can meet this demand for energy while also managing its environmental impacts as we're embarking on a green economy transition to be able to provide green jobs. So let me stop here for now. And uh, thank you very much, uh, Jiyun, for this opportunity. No, thank you, Janet, for, for sharing uh, the different strategies and also reassuring us that the you know, African Union members are uh, putting this as a priority. So you've heard it, there is buy-in. Uh, we are uh, short of skills, but also um, public and private investment. So this is uh, the next two speakers will <laughs> represent both public and private uh, um, investment. Michael, are you with us? Yes, I am. Super. So green jobs, uh, greening the agri-food sector, agri-tech, you, you, you heard it. Um, is this something private sector in African continent uh, interested in? And, uh, and moreover, um, is there a direct impact on uh, decent work creation for young people? And also, if I may add some local value uh, uh, retention uh, in the domestic, uh, <laughs> you know, so my, my um, answer for those who, who would want to summarize my, my response would be yes, yes, and yes. The but though is that nowhere near enough private capital is being mobilized. Um, you know, I hadn't heard in, in the very informative comments mentioned by our colleagues, um, the role of, of a market and an offtake for the enterprise that's creating the jobs. Um, and I would say that if you wanted to qualify my answer, the, the closer the activity, the operation, the enterprise is to one that is generating income and potentially able to generate a return on investment, the greater the interest of the private sector in investing. We're in, I still believe, a, a startup phase in the sense that 10 years ago, there were very few incubators, accelerators focused on small agri firms, rural or urban. There's a proliferation of them now working to provide young people with business skills. Um, there is this tech, uh, and I think I, I would just want to speak to the, the, the tech assumptions that young people make about I, I want to do drones, etc. In part, young people got that from a number of the development partners saying, okay, we think this will be interesting to young people. It's like a carrot. So you have a smartphone. Let me show you what you can do with your phone that relates to ag. Um, you have companies like uh, Hello Tractor that are trying to kind of use the tech, but show you what you can do with the tractor if, if that's your fancy. I think there's a greater need to, to share with young people the diversity of, of green jobs. And a number of speakers have mentioned that they have to be decent. I, you know, the, I mentioned the smartphone, it's ubiquitous for young people, which means whether I'm in a rural area or I'm in an urban area, I'm keeping up with the world. And my aspiration is to have the things, you know, it's very commercial. The content is very commercially driven these days. So if I'm seeing it, I'm not necessarily going to be content to sit in the village, look at it on my screen, but not aspire to get it. If I'm working with my family, then I have to encourage my family to pay me, is the decent work aspect, 
a wage um, and not have my father, grandfather say, well, I'm housing you. So that is a wage. So there's, there's a pool there. So what I've seen is where you have, for example, supplier development programs and a desire to aggregate the capacity of suppliers, then young people will get involved. Um, the, the, the dealing with climate change issues, if there are solutions, dealing with issues like um, the fact that we've talked about energy and I don't want to belabor that point, but that's a, that's a critical um, input from my vantage point that's needed. Um, but also, and, and again, a few of my fellow panelists have mentioned this, there's a desire for young people to eliminate what they see as some of the drudgery of, our, of, of agriculture. So, you know, again, we didn't really mention it, but the average age of a small hold farmer in a rural area is, is 60 plus. Um, and if I'm a young person, I'm watching that person do agriculture, um, not necessarily using modern farming techniques, uh, it can be backbreaking. And so that's not, and, and even in the, the promotion of rural agriculture, there's often an image of an elderly woman she's got a baby or a young woman got a baby on the back, something on her head. That's not attractive. Uh, and again, my, my colleague uh, Faustina pointed out that youth are not monolithic, but at the same time, there, there is this desire that if I'm working in agriculture, I'm doing a trade-off. And this is unfortunately, whether I'm educated or not, I'm, I could go to the city and hustle and make more because the, the, the economics of agriculture have to also improve. Uh, I, I think Janet pointed out a number of the challenges in, in terms of the business model of agriculture being challenging. You have the pests, you have the climate change, you have the fact, and, and one of our colleagues mentioned, young people typically don't own the land. And even in rural areas where there's land tenure, and that's another issue, it's often not, it's its own kind of by the community, access to land around which you can raise funds, secure uh, collateral is often absent. So that creates a disincentive uh, for investors. Now that said, I mentioned the accelerators, I mentioned the incubators. There's also an increasing pool of blended capital uh, where there's first loss provisions, impact investors who are saying, that said, let's, let's look at this because the continent's population next 28 years is going to double. So from a food security standpoint, we're gonna need uh, to eat on the continent, even though we import around 300 billion every year. Uh, so they're seeing that, well, if you, if you basically substituted some of those imports for locally produced food, there should be a market there. So that's driving increased interest um, in investing. The, a, a challenge though, and this is where stakeholders can play a role, particularly for young people, again, is aggregating them. Um, there are some who continue to say, well, just your half hectare, your two hectares is sufficient. Um, be a family farmer on that. I, I've, you know, again, worked in this space the last 12 years. I don't see how that's economically viable as a business um, because you have no economies of scale. And, and so there's a tension there, but you could maybe use a co-op, um, mm -hmm. outgrower schemes. There, there are ways to do it. And this is where some of the, I'll say, development-minded impact investors are, are focusing but we're still very much at the beginning. If we yeah. were to try and, and make a list of uh, models, you have another group that's trying to use online investment platforms mm -hmm. to capture those businesses that do exist. Um, and again, I'm using businesses because I don't see investment, say, in individuals. Um, there's not yet a great model where someone says, I have a business, and I'm employing lots of youth, invest in me. It's typically the entrepreneurs who are getting the capital right now. Mm -hmm. And COVID accelerated the pivot towards using online platforms for investment. So you can put the business plan, you put a profile of the enterprise, now that's, and you create deal rooms. Mm -hmm. So that's, a, again, a, a more recent development, last five years, but it's proliferating. Um, 
Lastly, I'll say that you have, again, some of the food companies mm -hmm. that recognize that there's a gap in terms of investing in early stage enterprises that are creating their own venture funds. Now, you know, it's in the bigger markets. It's a here in the South Africa, you know, possibly in a Kenya, Nigeria, where uh, there's a, a small venture fund, $10 million, that can provide capital, again, particularly to those entities that are in, in a supply chain, in a value chain. Mm -hmm. um, I, I just don't see it if, if one is disconnected from mm -hmm. The, the local food system that is for gain as opposed to uh, subsistence, um, you, you know, I don't see that that investment happening. But if you are tied to the food system, um, there is someone at the top of the, the value chain that is buying. There is an interest in investing in young people because the thought is if I invest in a young person now, they could be doing this 20, 30 years from now. If I invest in some of the, the elders who farm in rural areas, there's a very short time frame, and I'm not sure that miraculously young people will just jump into that business. So you, you yeah. do have a tug, there is investment. Um, the, the comments that were made by my colleagues about the, the greening of agriculture broadly, regenerative agriculture, you know, it, it, it's, it's uh, in vogue. And so it's attracting young people, but it's also attracting capital. And, and where they meet, that there's opportunities. But it's it's still, from my vantage point, something that in the next 10 years will ex be exponentially larger than, than currently. Okay. And, and lastly, I'll just say there's a need somehow to bring young people into more of these conversations mm -hmm. um, because, you know, I have, have worked closely with uh, most of the colleagues' institutions on the call and most of the time, it's an elder group of people having a conversation. Mm -hmm. and, and so even young thought leaders are not necessarily getting the benefit of this. By the time they get it, it's at the country level, which doesn't allow to me for intra-African learning amongst young people to share good practice. I did something in Benin. Hey, you could try this in Uganda, mm -hmm. or you could try this in South Africa. It's if you're in Uganda, you just stay in the ecosystem that's in Uganda, and we may trot you out at a, at a Pan-African platform and you tell your story, but you're not necessarily learning from your peers who are successful in other, other regions of the continent. Um, so I, I'll stop there, but Thanks, thank you. Thanks, Michael. Um, you started off with an overwhelming number of challenges and I thought, okay, private sector is not interested. And uh, you <laughs> nicely finishing with some messages of hope. Um, you know, linkages with markets, um, cooperatives, uh, local, local markets. I'm, I'm really interested in that, uh, developing local markets and local products. Um, and I heard also blended finance, which ni nicely links to um, uh, our next speaker, Jane. Uh, we're certainly not gonna get there with just private sector investments. So um, can you tell us a bit more? What is the experience of USAID in uh, designing uh, programs towards green jobs in rural areas for youth? And what has been some of the outcomes and lessons that you can share with us? Well, sure, Ji Yun, and thank you so much, um, everybody, for such an incredibly rich discussion. You know, I'm very conscious of the fact that we have gone long and we are at the end here. I do have some prepared remarks, but I'm thinking it might be better to perhaps provide them in written form later as some of the materials that come out and maybe instead just sort of hit a few high points and maybe someone could stick around even for some questions for the audience. Um, but, um, you know, I think a big shout out to my colleague Colin Van Buren, Dr. Colin Van Buren, who's also on the call and I hope can stick around for a couple of conversations. But together we've been working on a white paper on green jobs for youth and women in agriculture and water systems because we've been trying to um, work on understanding more the green jobs concept to inform our work. And, you know, short answer to your question is, you know, we do as USAID have a very compelling and strong policy base already to promote what can be considered to be green jobs for youth in rural areas. And we've already been doing quite a lot that counts as that, depending on the definition. And we've heard 
all kinds of um, examples that resonate. But actually, we haven't had a definition of green jobs ourselves. So we haven't necessarily been promoting them as, as such, you know. Um, but this is beginning to shift. In some cases, you know, we do have mechanisms that are aiming to mainstream green jobs. So, you know, to what extent are we all, meaning all, all of our stakeholders, you know, diagnosing opportunities and investing accordingly um, with youth inclusive, decent employment and climate uh, resilient, sustainable agricultural outcomes in mind, right? I think we've heard a lot today that there are many pieces. It's not just about the environmental impact, but it's about the journey there. It's about a just transition. It's about decent work and how that is working inclusively. Um, and our event today is very fortuitously timed in the end because on Earth Day last week, USAID released a climate strategy, which is um, really momentous. And it lays out ambitious targets uh, to tackle the existential threat of climate change over this decade. Um, and it is backed by President Biden's um, historic re request to quadruple international climate change financing by 2024. Um, so one of the elements of that is solidly youth engagement. There's an intermediate uh, result 1.5, which is about enabling and empowering women and youth and other marginalized groups uh, and underrepresented groups to lead climate action. We also have um, similar provisions in our refreshed global food security strategy. And a lot of the language that is in there in short is about that nexus of job quality um, and understanding that youth engagement in agriculture and food systems with more and better opportunities can help achieve climate adaptation and mitigation goals, right? Um, we also have an employment framework that speaks to better jobs. But what we've been grappling with is practically, you know, what does that mean, right? And I think some of the things that we found is, um, you know, a lot of the work we're doing on climate smart agriculture, drip irrigation, conservation farming, skilled labor pest management, improved post harvest storage and handling, aquaculture, many things, you know, they all would actually fall under current definitions of. Um, green jobs, right? Because they're intended also to result in better environmental outcomes. But as was said earlier, you know, we realize there are very diverse pathways in specific concept, uh, contexts. Um, and, um, you know, we can get confused as to whether we're talking about a job. Uh, a lot of the things I just mentioned are actually practices, right? And is it the pathway really then to a, a, a green outcome, understanding that um, maybe brown jobs are still realistic for people in many settings and oftentimes can be on that pathway to greener outcomes. Um, and you know, the work of ILO and others has shown too that there still are barriers to youth and we've heard a lot about them in terms of skilling as well. And also gender was brought up, um, issues of conservation ag, for example, and exacerbating actually the labor burden that off, off, often falls to um, young women uh, and older women as well. So these are all uh, of strong concern to us. We're extremely excited. Um, we are highly focused on inclusive uh, agricultural markets that build a climate resilient, sustainable ag future and now. Um, but we need to consider those things together in order to deliver on those problems. And, and we know that a, there's much more to a job than just emissions, right? And we're also interested uh, in learning more too about the implications for land and water, et cetera. So I'll stop there, thanks. Thank you, Jane. And again, apologies for the delay, um, but I mean, it, it just, uh, you know, I needed to 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 let these um, really special speakers uh, express themselves. Otherwise, it wasn't uh, it was it was just too rich. So thank you so much uh, to all the panelists. I, I'm um, we've gone over time, so <laughs> I'm happy to take uh, you know some urgent questions. Um, if someone would like to take the floor, uh, let's see. Anybody have a raised hand? Or are there questions, uh, Lise or uh, Anna? Uh, 
Are there questions from the chat? Uh, because the Q&A doesn't seem to work. So are there urgent questions um, to the panelists? Let me have this. Um, Gio, I suggest we move on to the poll. And okay. um, if there are further questions, we can might discuss them also in further um, sessions or webinars. Okay. Yeah, so as you can imagine, there's so much uh, information um, around green jobs and, you know, obviously beyond green jobs. So we have a, a poll. How do, can we project the poll question with the, um, yeah. So these are some of the topics that we would, uh, we could address in future uh, panels or, or, or dialogue, uh, but we were interested in learning from you uh, whether, you know, what topics you would like to hear more about, learn more about, um, you can uh, take on as many as you would like, or just the, the most um, important ones for you. And then we, we do project the poll result at the end. Oh uh, yeah, it seems like uh, all participants can vote except for the panelists. <laughs> yep, I can vote. Which is highly unfair, Jane. Yeah, what is this? <laughs> but we, <laughs> I don't know what happened there. So as the poll gets done, we still have um, some time for, for a question. Otherwise, we have gone well over uh, our time but I see still uh, many people are with us. So thank you very much for your you know, engagement and interest. And uh, I believe this uh, webinar is recorded and we may uh, also be able to make a summary uh, through the um, technical working group. Um, I think Lise posted the, the link to, to our group and, and the global, development, the global donor uh, platform on rural development. Okay, so I mean, we see the result, the con concept of green job definitions, uh, financing seems to be, uh, and, and training seems to be one of the top topics. Um, but I mean, it's interesting to see that they're all equally uh, more or less uh, important. So we, we, as we were discussing amongst the group to do some series of this uh, along the green jobs and green transition, I think these, these um, inputs will be very useful. Um, I'm going to uh, give the floor back to maybe Frank to close. Uh, if you have any you know, last words on, on where this is gonna go or just thanking all the panelists for, for being here with us. Yeah, thank you very much. Also, thanks a lot to all speakers, participants for the rich discussion. I also found it uh, amazing that there's a lot of substance already in terms of definition, concepts, good examples. I think a lot of them, maybe not everything is new, yeah, but I think that's okay. And um, still, it's, I think, a little bit of a challenge to get a grip on what we're actually talking about and how to bring it into good concepts, into good projects, into good investments also from the private sector. So I think there is still some way to go. And yeah, I think it's nice to have that feedback that there's more interest on the topic. And also uh, actually in mostly all of the topics we had in, in our mind uh, in the preparation. So I think that's good news. We will get back to you on this with probably further webinars or um, further outreach on the topic. And yeah, 
thanks a lot to to everyone again i think um, it the topic is highly relevant we saw that no, it won't go away it will be on our agenda uh, in the upcoming month and years so, so very much looking forward to engage with you and thanks a lot for the participation thanks to Jiyun for the nice moderation and for you everyone to to stay on board until i think half an hour over time next time we'll do two hours <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much everyone thank you thank very you. much Bye. it's a pleasure thank you thank, thank you, you everyone. Everyone. Good morning. Good night.